I learn and I research and I still learn and research. Every day I would listen and I still am now because this morning I was over um, doing a group for parents, which was about an hour away in the car and an hour away back. So I listened to two hours worth of audio books. I read and read and read and read and read and read whatever the latest research is there. I'm like a sponge and I eat it up and I make notes and I memorise it or I learn it and I turn it into workshops. Interviewing Autumn was like unwrapping a, a gift. There were so many hidden surprises in everything that Autumn does today. But it started at a really, really young age. And when you listen to the story and you hear how her life started, she was interested and curious from a very young age and and you can tell by that snippet the curiosity never stopped and her interest and her appetite for learning this interview is just a massive lesson for everybody out there who's in business everybody who wants to get into business that it's just not good enough to learn something and then deliver it or sell it you've got to continuously look and learn about the new things that are coming down the track. And and Autumn is obviously somebody who does this religiously every single day. You are really going to love this interview. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Autumn. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm really well. And Thank you for coming on the podcast. We had a bit of preamble about the name. So <laughs> in a bit, you're going to have to explain people what your name's about. Let, let me just repeat in case people didn't hear it. It's autumn as in the season. Um, so we'll get we'll get on to that. We'll get on to that. But um, this is the first question I ask all my guests just to get things started. And then it automatically flows into all the other things we want to learn about you. Tell us a little bit about your personal life. So where were you born? A little bit about your, you know, your education. Have you moved around the country or the world where you now live? So over to you, Autumn. OK, I'm I was born in Watford. So Watford, just out of sight of London. Um, I went to the local education system. My first job well, I was actually always keen to work. I've always loved working. And so my first job when I was, when I was 12, and I actually worked on a milk float. Wow. Now, yeah. <laughs> it was, I really, really wanted to, I've always, always loved to work and loved to do things. And I wanted a paper round, but my family wouldn't let me get a paper round because they thought it was too dangerous having me going off, putting papers through people's doors. And so they've actually got a family friend who actually had, what well, I think it was, um, yeah, Express Dairy. Yes. Yeah, it was Express Dairy. And, you know, some milk people back then used to actually have people, children helping them. And so I began to actually work from about four or five o'clock in the morning at the weekends, going around delivering milk for people. Well, I you've, loved you've, it. you've jumped to the milk float really quickly and I wanted you to share a little bit more about what happened in Watford. This is, this is in Watford. I was only 12. Okay. So only 12 when you were doing, <laughs> I see yeah. what you mean. So you weren't doing any education as well, or you were doing oh, that God, at the yes, same yes, time? Yes, yes, yeah. Of course. I was at school. Right. I was at school, but this is, um, this was my first job, you could say. So I was 12 years old oh, when I had God. my first job. Yes, of course I was at school studying and doing all the normal things I was doing, but I yeah. always loved to do work, do things. And so I was always out and about. And so it started off at four or five o'clock in the morning on the weekends, I used to run around and it was through Watford Town Centre actually put in, I'm going to say milk through people's doors. I am not joking. It did often used to get posted because it used to be in almost like little half pint cardboard containers. Right. You could actually post. But that's, what were you allowed to do that at 12? Ah, Possibly not, because no. <laughs> I think I think the official working age was 14. Yeah, yeah. 
because I then wanted to do another job, something a little bit more kinds of um, with more prestige. Yes. And so at 14, I actually walked around virtually every single shop in Watford Town Centre asking if they had any Saturday jobs going. Wow. <laughs> and they said that you could only do it when you were something like 14 and a half. Right. And yeah, and one person actually contacted me back when I did turn exactly 14 and a half. And that's when I started working for Curtis Shoe Shop at the weekends. Wow. <laughs> so you were quite kind of at a very, very young age, very entrepreneurial, weren't you? And looking back, I think I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Blimey. Looking back, I actually think I was quite, I was always doing something. Oh, gosh. And did you, do you remember what you got an paid? Child. <laughs> do you remember if you got paid for that milk float job? Yeah, I did. I got five pounds. Wow, that's but, a lot of money. But at Christmas, I got so much money because it was a lot of the re I, we used to go around the town centre and we had lots of arms houses and he used to deliver to a lot of pensioners. Mm. and shops and so I got tipped hugely and I can remember having so much money then thinking wow look at this <laughs> incredible incredible <laughs> and, and so that was 12 years 14 years old you were still at school yeah um, what happened then okay then I continued I was I suppose I was lucky I was quite good at passing qualifications. Right. And so I could actually, you could say, memorise the information, then just go back straight into school and repeat it to pass the exams. Oh, wow. Mm. I've always had a bit of that ability. And so I didn't go to school, hands up, I didn't go to school an awful lot in the last year, but I still did very well, actually, when I come to do my qualifications. Right. Brilliant. I decided to not go on to do my A-levels at that stage because yeah. you're getting the feel of this. I wanted to go out and earn money. Yes, I quite <laughs> so agree. I really want that. So I wanted to go out and earn money. So I got um, my first job was actually my first proper job was for the British Frisian Cattle Society of Great Britain and Ireland. Milk again. I <laughs> <laughs> So it's the British Frisian Cattle Society of Great Britain and Ireland, which wow. is basically a fan club yeah. for people that love, love Frisian cows. Oh, my God. Which, of and course, so, are from the Netherlands. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> because Frisian comes from the county Friesland, or f spelled exactly the same, but with L-A land, Friesland, F-R-I-E-S land. Okay. which is where the Frisian cows come from. Well, I had no idea. Yeah, the black and white cows, aren't they? Yes, yes, yes. the huge big black and white cows. The black and white cows, yeah. They're, it, very, they're, they're related to the Netherlands in some way. <laughs> it was absolutely a lovely, lovely job. It was in this huge big stately home where there was a lake going through the back garden where you could just kind of like eat your lunch out by the lake, go paddling in the lake, and they turned this big stately home into this mm, fan club or some kind of control system where every cow had a birth certificate. Wow. I, I know, it's a that's, huge big thing, Frisian cows. <laughs> it, obviously a huge big thing, yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> And so all around this building is big pictures of cows with big udders and <laughs> and rosettes and all these type of things. And I was actually, because I was quite young, I was 16, when I started there, it was, um, I did a little bit of everything. So they used me, they took on some young people to cover in all different departments. Right. So they trained you up on the reception, they trained you up in the post Yes. Um, room. I think in the post room, once I actually opened one of the letters, which was mostly birth certificates of cows, somebody wow. had sent in, uh, by accident, a birth certificate of their child. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a human birth certificate that ended up there. <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> did you, obviously, did you have the... The person's address to send it back to. Yes, we did. <laughs> okay, that's good. What? So, what did the 
so was it a charity? I don't think so. I think no. this was a paid member club. A member I, club. I took part in one of the, um, I think it was, because coming from just outside London, there were lots and lots of um, parades and marches, um, summertime things. And I think my boyfriend at the car time was the back end of a cow as we were walking through the streets of London promoting British Region Cattle Society. And there's pictures of me dressed up as a, um, a cow girl, a cow maiden. Yes. <laughs> Actually, you are right, from the Netherlands, because I had one of those wooden things and carrying pails. Yes, yes. <laughs> so Over now, your shoulders. that does make sense. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, incredible. And how long did you do that for? Not an awfully long time. I did it for about six months a year because then I actually um, – saw an advert for a job for Amersham International, which right. was a lab technician. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so I applied for this job as Amersham International, working on a radioactive plant. Whoa. Now, I'd had a little bit of experience working in a chemist. Right. <laughs> beforehand. So I went, al I went along for this job, and the money was huge for me back then. Oh, good heavens, I was 18. Yes. It was something like 13000 a year, which back then was a lot of money. And I was looking yeah. at it thinking, wow. Yeah. And the man that interviewed me, he said to me, he said, look, you haven't really got the qualifications. He said, but you've got enthusiasm. That's what matter. Yeah. And so he gave me the job. Right. Which was quite interesting because I didn't actually even know the periodic table then. I'm working with all these radioactive materials. I was opening the lead pots to see what was inside. <laughs> oh, my word. But I was a quick learner. He was right. And so that was one of the things that I did pick up, very quick learning. And I started to go to London to do a lot more qualifications and studying. Right. And it was, it was a lovely place again, Amersham International. It really was right. quite a nice job. But then... I was mm. coming up, to, I was due to get married. And suddenly I thought, hmm, I think I might need another job. So I started to look around and I saw an evening job working for the North Thames Trader. Right. Now, the North Thames Trader was an advertising magazine, advertising, I think it's your cars. Right. And so I got that job. And so I was working during the day for Amersham International and then during the evening I was working for the North Thames Trader, and that's when I realised I was quite good at sales. Right. If I look back as well, I was planning to get married and then move into my first home away from home. So I was buying a house in Bletchley, and I had a scrapbook, and I was cutting out loads of little pictures of what I wanted my house to look like, mm. sticking them all into this scrapbook. Mm. Without realising it, I was making a vision board for myself at the age of 18. My God. I, I I think, you know, now I actually sometimes do law of attraction workshops as one of the different things I do. Yes. And when I look back, I can see what I was doing so clearly without realising it. Yeah. And so I was putting all of these things on. I was realising to do this, I had to do extra work. So although I had a well-paid job, I was also doing the sales job, which was bringing me lots and lots and lots more money into my life. Hmm. in order to buy all of these things. So at the age of 20, I moved out, went on a honeymoon to Bulgaria and Turkey, came back, and literally, I think the day after, moved in to my brand new house with all new furniture. Fantastic. Yeah. And so it's really, it shows you that when your mind, and in my head, no one told me I couldn't do that. No. No one told me, oh, you know, don't you think that's a little bit much at such a young age? Yeah. It was something that I didn't conceive not possible. Right, right. And I just did it because no one said I couldn't. I love it. So then, but funny how things go, it ends us up that I, um, within the year, I'd actually started to have some children. Right. And so there's most of my 20s. I was still working, but just backing it down a bit. I had my own sales and marketing company, but I began to have a few children. I ended up having four children. Right. So I also started a study and I started to study psychology. Whilst you were looking after your kids? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, I did. While I was looking after my children, I think my children's earliest memories were probably their mum constantly studying with her head in a book. It came everywhere with us. It came with me when I took them to play areas. It came with me whenever we went on holiday. I was doing a degree in psychology. Came with me everywhere. Mm. Sometimes, because having four children and they had their friends in, and I still was working, mostly doing sales type work. And I was the chair of the PTA at the local school as well right. and doing voluntary work. Right. <laughs> and so sometimes when it was coming close to doing the essays, I used to go in the toilet and lock the door because it's the only place in the house where I could actually keep the children out just to, oh, finish, my my, <laughs> just to finish my essays. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> but it happened <laughs> and yeah. I passed. And so then that took me to about my early 30s. And when I was in my early 30s, I passed my degree in psychology. That was at the um, Symphony Hall. I'd moved to Birmingham, by the way, at that stage. Right. When I was actually in my early 20s, I actually moved up to Birmingham um, through work. At the time, I was working for sales. Right. Can you remember Encyclopedia Britannica? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. When my children... can. When my children were quite young, I actually moved up with Encyclopedia Britannica, who gave me a lot more background onto sales and a lot of different sales training. And they were a lovely, lovely company. And so I came up with them. And that's when I located and I've never moved away from Birmingham since because it is a wonderful city. Mm. It's big enough that it never gets me bored, but small enough wherever I go, I bump into people I know. Yes. It is like a village, I have to say, yeah. And I've got, yeah, and I, I do love it here and I've never wanted to move anywhere else apart from here. Mm. And so that's when I started to, I've got my degree at the Symphony Hall and it was Bethy, Betty Boothroyd who actually handed my degree. Oh my God. And I went on stage and I had all my family there. So my husband at the time and my four children and I went on stage and they all started to whoop me going, go mum, go mum. <laughs> and she turned around and said, have you brought your own fan club with you? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and so then I thought, well, I've got this qualification. I'd better do something with it because I thought I could either carry on the rest of my life doing sales and marketing. Yes. Or I could actually change it into helping people. Mm. So I started working at Birmingham Mind. Okay. And I started to just do a few hours each week for Mind. And then it progressed and it progressed and it progressed into being a full-time job. Could you and explain was, what, who they are and what they – what they because people might not know what they're about. Birmingham Mind – well, Mind itself is one of the largest mental health charities in the UK. Yeah. Now, the national company Mind, they actually lobby the parliament for changes in the law. And I don't know if he still is, but Stephen Fry used to be a member and lots of famous people used to be a member of Mind. Yes. But it's also broken up around the UK into smaller local charities that do the more grassroots stuff. We're actually there helping people. Yeah. And actually doing, um, you could say, doing running workshops, just being there to support people with mental health problems. Yes. And so I was the women's worker, so I used to be in community settings helping women to recover from various mental health problems. Right. I was a trainer there for a while as well, so I was for a while I was actually running training courses and training up people on mind. But then I decided to do a Himalayan trek. Right. It's a charity fundraiser for Mind. And so me and a friend walked up the Indian Himalayas, not on our own. We actually were guided up there. Mm. And (laughs) so I did all the training and I was on the way up the mountain in the Himalayas. And then all of a sudden it came to me. I thought I must start my own company again. Right. Whilst you were up on the mountain or? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Literally, because sometimes these ideas come to you when the world is quiet. Yes. Sometimes you need silence to actually see things and have some of your best ideas, almost like your gut instincts. And I did. And so when I came down the Himalayas, I went to my manager 
And I said to my manager, I'm going to leave Birmingham Mind. I'm going to start my own company. And I gave her a time scale, something like eight months I'm going to be left. In four months, I'm going part time. Right. And she said, you don't need that much time. You don't need that much notice. And I said, I do for me. I had to tell her I needed to almost like have it known that this was going to happen. Yeah. I put it in my diary. Four months later, going part time, you know, eight months leaving. And I stuck to it. And in that time, I started to do some of the base work of actually establishing my own company. And so I started to run mindfulness workshops. I did my first personal development workshops. I wrote a book in that stage. I actually had some ideas that were rather silly when I look back and they didn't last that long. Sure. I had, I had this really good idea. It was called Gentle Instructions to Change Your Life, where I was going to be emailing people around the world and sending them an instruction every day. Yeah. But about a few months into that, I realized it was incredibly hard work for not a lot of comeback, so I let that one go. Yeah. But the other things continued and flowered and prospered and got bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. And so now, mainly, my main job involves doing workshops around the Midlands. I do a lot of workshops, not just mindfulness now. I do over about 40 different workshops, everything from confidence building to... 40, four zero. Yeah, more wow. than, Yeah. I do them every Monday night, Wednesday night, Saturday, Saturday afternoon, as always. And then I do extra ones monthly in Wolverhampton, Walsall and other places that sometimes want me to come in. Yeah. So I cover about 40 different subjects. And some of the ones are assertiveness. I have slipped back into doing some sales oriented ones as well. Right. <laughs> because I think that is a real passion and a love for me because I love people, whatever it is in so i do goal settings procrastination motivation workshops do law of attraction workshops i do self-compassion um self-esteem a whole variety of different workshops i do on a rotating basis because you do need to blend yourself to what is needed if you keep on doing the same thing over and over and the world's moved on and you're stuck. You can't progress. So you need to see what needs, what people want to support them. Yeah, understand. Yeah, of course. And you did, you started with these workshops. Yeah. Straight out of coming out of mind. Yes. And I was overlapping at a time. At one time, I was working part time for mind and doing my workshops as well when I was part time. And were mind your customer at all or not <laughs> funny thing is they are now right they are now but not at the time i was no. still i mean you i think um you've got to be very careful when you're leaving a company you can't leave a company and then go straight back in no almost like a self-employed contractor mm. and so i think there needs to be a bit of change you know when you come around and come out because i don't just do workshops uh, my public ones are open to anybody to come along to. But I also do ones in companies. And so I go now into Birmingham Mind. I go to the Alzheimer's Society. I go to, I'm trying to think, Help Harry, Help Others. Lots and lots and lots of charities I go into as well to deliver my personal development workshops, mindfulness. But I also do laughter yoga as well, which seems to be incredibly popular. <laughs> Right, that's good. I don't know if you've ever known what laughter yoga is. It's a very strange thing, but it makes you feel happy. And I think the whole essence of what I do is to make people become the support people, to become the best version of themselves and actually find true happiness yeah. in whatever they do. Mm. And, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a whole podcast in its own right, I think, if we if we delved into that. But what? So was all of this, you know, deciding to run these workshops, um, you obviously inspired. How long were you with Birmingham Mind in the end? In the end, I was with them for 10 years. Wow. Okay. That's a long time. Yeah. And, but, that, okay, so I get that. You were with them. You did your Himalayan journey. You got this awareness that you need to do something on your own, which you then did. But 
that training you had in mind by delivering workshops with them must have given you the skill and the appetite to then do that for yourself. Yeah, I've always done training. When I actually had my own company in my only 20s, I was writing my own scripts, going out selling advertising space because I'd learned those skills from when I was working at the North Thames Trader. Then when I worked, so I was always training and encouraging people back then. Right. And then from there, I went on to when I worked for Encyclopedia Botanica, I used to train people up on sales techniques then. So my manager right. used to send me around the country to train up some sales reps that right. possibly didn't have the talents. And so okay. I always have, I think, had it in me a bit of a trainee, mm, mentoring type of thing going on. Got you. Right. That <laughs> makes a lot of sense then, because yeah. if you're working for a company doing that kind of stuff, then you obviously feel you're a natural at it. You can do this for yourself. Yeah. But then, of course, you've got to decide what workshops you're going to deliver. Yeah. How did, how did that come about? Quite slowly. I mean, I started off doing mindfulness because going back then, I think six or seven years ago, it was the in thing mindfulness was. And when I was working for mind, I wasn't doing, although I was the training person for a while, training people up, I was just supporting women in um, supportive networks. It wasn't about delivering workshops to them. It was about, um, I think, just supporting them. So I used to support them when we used to go in the community and take part in lots of activities and drama that was going on. But then I took in mindfulness into mind because I read this book, I think it was, or I saw something on TV and I thought, oh. And the funny thing is, I when I read the first book on mindful, I thought that's how I've always lived my life. Don't everybody live their life like that? Mm. Don't everybody wake up in the morning and say, wow, it's a beautiful day. Or if there's a puddle, want to jump in it and wonder a flower. I don't think I've ever lost that wonder for life. Right. And I had no idea that it was something that would help people find their happiness okay. and that it was what people were actually missing or a lot of people. Yeah. And so when I was actually started to do the mindfulness in the very beginning, in some ways I was just helping people do what I tended to do naturally. Yes. I think I've always had that, whatever the bad situation is, right, what good can we get out of it? What mm. can I learn for this? It's almost been like my default position. And so I started off doing mindfulness outside of mind in community venues. One of the first places I did it was the Yort Cafe in Borsall Heath. Right. But then I realised that I couldn't just keep on doing mindfulness. No. And so I think my next one was confidence. So I right. started to do a confidence workshop and then an assertiveness one and then a who are you workshop where people looked at their roots to see how they became who they became. Yeah. And then I just listened to people. When I was doing my workshop, I picked up things. There was obviously a need for a workshop to be in right? from listening to people. And I always actively said to people that came to my workshop, if there's anything you think needs to be workshopped for people to learn, let me know. Right. And they did. One person said, what about guilt and rejection? I suffer terribly with guilt. And so I did a workshop on how to rebuild your life from a life of guilt and rejection. Another one on trust. And so I started to do a workshop on trust, rebuilding skills on trust. But, okay, so my question is, I get the mindfulness thing. You said you'd read a book on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you decided to diversify into other workshops like confidence assertiveness yep. who are you but where did you get the skill for i know you did the psychology degree but where did you get the skill to be able or the content even to be able to deliver those workshops i learn and i research and i still learn and research every day i would listen and i still am now because this morning i was over um, doing a group for parents, which was about an hour away in the car and an hour away back. So I listened to two hours worth of audiobooks. 
I read and read and read and read and read and read whatever the latest research is there. I'm like a sponge and I eat it up and I make notes and I memorize it or I learn it and I turn it into workshops. Right. You can't carry on doing things like this if you're stuck in past <clears throat> learning modes. Mm. You've got to be current. Yeah. You need to know what the latest research is in whatever you're delivering the course on. Yeah. I have even written a workshop because at the moment I'm well, recently, I was going to say this year's thing that I've been two big things that I've been learning this year, and that is on quantum physics. So I've molded quantum physics with mindfulness. So I've done a workshop on both of those together because it's a surprising amount of new research, which is actually supporting mindfulness from quantum physics and vice versa and also um, the need to allow yourself to be vulnerable to become your best most authentic self and so I've been doing a lot of research on vulnerability and how being vulnerable is an incredibly strong quality so that's a new workshop that I'm writing you can't be behind the times you need to just keep on and I and I think if you, it's impossible to run the amount of workshops that I run if you aren't somebody that's an avid learner. Yeah. If you're not somebody that don't stay with the times. I listen to series of lectures. I mean, some of the things that I listen to are 18, 20 hours long that I'm making notes of and um, saying who has said this and what's happened there. If you're going to do this on a long-term basis, you need to. Sure. Brilliant. And it's, I mean, I, I do understand what you're saying about, it's interesting how they often say that um, we don't do a huge amount of learning, practical learning at school, do we? It's just about passing the exams and being able to apply yourself to that. But after we leave school, it's almost like if you've got the right mindset, then yeah. then the learning really starts uh, when you're interested in certain topics, and certainly sounds like you, you know, you finished school relatively early, but that's when your learning then started, and you became interested in certain topics, and your appetite for learning continues to grow as you get older. You know, I do. I do think your parents and your parental influence is huge, though. I grew up in a house where we was always reading. Right. I grew up with a very, very positive role models. I grew up with my nan and dad, my grand, my nan and granddad. Yeah. It was something that happened in back in the end of the sixties. I grew. I got told that my well, I didn't get told. I was led to believe that my granddad was my dad, and my nan was my mum. Right. And that my mother, biological mum, was my sister. And so that was an environment that I grew up in. So I was almost like um, an only child with this big sister who never lived with us. Yeah. But it turned out she was my mum. But in that environment, it was, in, though you could say it was quite negative, it was actually incredibly positive. Right. Because they adored me and they told me whatever I wanted to do, you can do whatever you want to do if you want it lot big enough. Yeah. They used to tell me things like, never stop learning. Look each day for what new thing you've learnt. Wow. And so, and that's where the mindfulness come from as well. We're forever out in the garden looking at life, looking at the wonder. So it was a very calm childhood I had. Yeah. One of a lot of peace and a lot of encouragement. Where I saw my mum and dad reading every day, where I was encouraged to ask as many questions as I possibly could, and they would always give me the answers. Mm. And so almost you can say I was learning more at home than I was at school. Yeah. yeah. Because it was a very, very positive, rewarding, loving environment. It was never what you can't do. It was always what you can do. So even at home, and I am talking about from the age of probably seven or eight, I was reading my own books and then writing my own book reviews for them. <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing, I, I used to um, go, I was never keen on um, travel. 
I used to get car sick. I think a lot of people, a lot more people, children did back then because we never did it as much. No. And so I used to prepare myself for a holiday that was coming up. And again, I was something like eight years old. And I used to do myself. So when I knew I had a summer holiday in about the about the March, April, I used to do myself my own box of, box of goodies to open on the car journey. So I wrote myself a story. I did myself crosswords did myself dot to dots. I brought little colouring in books and pens to put in my box, sweets to open, magazines to read. So during the long car trip to holiday, I then wrap it up, put it in the back of a cupboard. And then on the day of the holiday, I would take it out and I'd actually read my own stories. It sounds sad, doesn't it? How <laughs> old were you? <laughs> read my own stories, <laughs> solve my own crosswords, do my own dot to dot. <laughs> How old were you? About seven, eight. That's ridiculous. And so, but it's and also it's like, brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant, I think. But when you look at it now, when I do workshops on self-compassion and self-love, it was something I did from the youngest age, naturally to myself. Yes. I was actually looking after myself yes. when I was going to be travelling, which is something I didn't like to do. Yes. Instead of... Instead, you were taking responsibility for yourself at a very young age then, weren't you? Yeah, I was. And so I was taken, like I said, even when I was decided that I wanted to go and start earning money, it wasn't that I wasn't give, being given pocket money. I was. I think my parents were kind of like, why does she need even more money? Yeah. But it was that strong, independent streak in me Yeah, that wanted to do my own things and I don't I actually don't know where that came from apart from them telling me I could yeah you know if you get told you know if you want it enough you can do anything it's only mm. people that put up their own um barriers that stop them succeeding and doing yeah. things they want to do yeah brilliant <laughs> I love it I it's it's a it's a massive lesson isn't it I mean now I think it's very rare that You've got that self-responsibility in kids. I mean, maybe it was rare then. Maybe you were just unique. Um, but I've certainly not heard people at that age or children at that age being able to do something like that for themselves. So if you've always been writing since that really young age, um, what what books have you written? I've only written one. It was um, It's 30 Days to Change Your Life. But I am. I started to write this new book. And it was going to be almost semi-autobiographical. And so it was going to be looking back over my whole life. Right. It's called Reflections of a Happy Dead Person. So it was going to be this um, fantasy book of me being knocked over by a bus, ending up in heaven. Heaven, in my mind, it was going to be this beautiful white room with plush carpets, nice furnishing, nothing at all apart from peace and tranquility. So when I decided I was going to write this book, my life was quite chaotic at the time. I was having lots of work, lots of children, lots of things. Yes. So I, and then I was going to reflect back over my whole life. Yeah. This is about four years ago when I started to write this book. And it was that boring. It began to bore me. And I thought, oh. so I let it be for about three years and I didn't do anything. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, I picked it up again and I got rid of everything I wrote apart from the title and I let my imagination start to rewrite it. And this time, it is total fiction. Still somebody being knocked over, reflecting back over their life. Yes. But it is in a total fantasy fiction fun way. It's a little bit like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in the kind of like the mentality it's written. Mm. And it is incredibly fun writing it. Yeah. So that's what I'm spending quite a bit of my time at the moment on. Right. That and one or two other major projects that I'm doing is actually writing and getting finished this book called Reflections of a Happy Dead Person, where she's looking back over her life, but she's actually – I can see now, I can see traits of my life coming in to a degree, but only in the mildest things. Yes. She's trying to find people's lost happiness. Because mm. if you don't pay attention to your happiness, the happiness runs away. And, you know, I, it's interesting you talk about lost happiness and the happiness runs away. What you were doing when you were 
eight years old, seven, eight years old with your box that you created for your holidays, you were creating like a happiness box. Yeah. Yeah, I know. A little box of happiness, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, I was. <laughs> yeah, I was. And so this is kind of like, it's funny how things turn around and how they come around. And now all these years on, I'm writing a book. I'm running workshops for people to find their own happiness. Yes. And I'm actually writing this fantasy fiction book, which is taking fictional characters and going back to the beginning to find out where they'd lost their happiness. But writing this book is actually making me laugh. It is really funny. It's, uh, you could say, absurd in some parts. But it's so much more fun than when I, than what I'd originally planned it to be. Yeah. So it's almost not me writing it. It's my hand writing it. But I'm almost like I'm almost automatic pilot. It's writing itself, which I, mean, I think is the way books are supposed to be written. That's what they say. Yes. Yeah, that's they do say that. I've heard that a lot. I'm I'm still procrastinating about a book. Okay. I mean, it was it was tough for me to start blogging or writing um, because I had some sort of bizarre past life issue that my stuff got stolen, and okay. I was always worried about people stealing my knowledge. Okay, uh, and I didn't want to write it down, bizarrely, but I I, I have changed. <laughs> I've changed. <laughs> um, so, okay. Brilliant. I love it. 40 odd workshops. That's unbelievable. I've never heard anybody do that many different <laughs> ones. That's just and and God, you, you must have some sort of energy level to be able to deliver all of that. I know they're not all at the same time. They're revolving and recycling and changing and adding and dropping and all of that. But, you know, how many hours do you a week do you work? Okay, I probably work less than most nine till five jobs. It's just different hours. Right. That's all it is. It's just in a different way. And if you take somebody's job and you break down all of the different bits they do, it would sound like a lot. But what it is, is when you, I do one-to-ones, one-to-one counselling, one-to-one life coaching, I go into companies and deliver workshops and I do my normal amount. I'm almost right in the book. I run spoken word and music events, occasionally a festival. I'm developing something called the Smiley Brain, which is um, an app on a phone and also a cuddle cushion, which is a sleep aid. But sounds like a lot. But when you put it over a whole week and you break it down, I get a lot of free time, which I enjoy. So I still now go for lots of walks go swimming, take myself out, have lots of holidays, because it is really important that you look after yourself too. Yes. It's really important that you get space and time for yourself. And one of the best things, it sounds absolutely ridiculous, one of the best things I love doing is just walking the dog in parks. Mm. Even One of my best places is the Liso Park in Hales Owen, because I'm always finding bits I've never been to. Yeah. And just sitting on a log and just being. And just thinking, listening to life happening around you, listening to the birds. Mm. And I will never get bored of doing that. Never, ever just being out there and being in nature. Mm. And I think that keeps me and it always has kept me since I was walking, you could say. Yeah. It's something I've always loved to do. Brilliant. Yeah. And so let's take... What what's the most successful workshop that you're delivering right now? Oh, okay. If you want to know the most successful ones that I do, yeah, the, mo the most. These. Okay, the most popular ones that yeah. I do is dating ones. Dating. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to do with dating is I do um, dating body language. Right. I do about four or five different dating ones. I do dating body language. I do the dating game, how to win and lose. That's all about dating apps. I do um, date a coaching dating ones where it literally starts looking at your past mistakes and how to um, put them to bed. Mm. I look at one, how to find a life partner. And the other dating one I do is I actually do, um, it's like a dating club. So it's taking it where men and women can meet each other. Mm. And so people come along, it's normally about two hours. I start off doing some fun icebreakers and games. I do a short dating workshop 
And then I put people onto tables with games on them. So I mix them up. It should be the mixed, same mixture of men and women. I have about four tables. And the games are just a ruse, really, for them to actually get to know each other and talk with a medium of um, things like charades. Yes. Or different games on each table. But the games are really just there to break the ice a bit. Yes, of course. Then at the end of the session, they each get a card saying who would like to get to know who more. Right. Yeah. And I say, even if you don't want to get to know anybody, put a smiling face. I want a card from everybody. Mm. And then the following day, I contact people and say, who wants to get to know each other? And so, yeah, my dating workshops are very popular. <laughs> and so that's incredible because, yeah, it's so popular now, isn't it? Yeah. Because of, well, because of, dare I say, a Tinder and all sorts of other dating apps that people are using these days. And Love Island and all of those people are going crazy over that. Um, okay, so and what about what about the mindfulness stuff? Is that popular? I still do mindfulness. It's what I started with, and so I can't stop doing it. And I love doing it. But even my mindfulness um, sessions and workshops are probably not the same as others. Because they've been going for so long, I bring everything into them. Yeah. And so I try to make them fun, encouraging. I do uh, mindfulness with, like I said, quantum physics. I do mindfulness with intentions, where we kind of like set intentions. I do mindfulness walks. I'm doing a mindfulness and a self-compassion retreat in August. Yeah. And watch out, there's two places available, only just two places. And so if anybody wants to come along for an amazing so I think it's three nights, four days, mindfulness, self-compassion retreat in Wales. Contact me quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so spread the word there on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, you've done it. You've done it. <laughs> Brilliant. De so what have I missed with, with, with my probing questions? What, what haven't you covered that you're up to today? Um, I'm trying to think. I do... Um, I do and I have done for about six years or seven years spoken word and music events. Right. And these have always been very popular. I open, I, the last few years I've been opening the Wolverhampton Literary Festival and a lot of people sometimes contact me to actually do events for them. I'm going to be doing Minds one this year on October the 10th. Right. They're going to be having, um, and it's at the Nighting, hold on. So the Night Owl in town, a pub. Right. In Digbeth. I think it's in Digbeth. Right. But contact me if you want to know more events. And that's going to be open for everybody because it's on World Mental Health Day on the 10th of October. Right. And it's going to be music and spoken word an evening of as well. So I'm going to be running that and I'm going to be hosting that. So my connections with mind are still there. Absolutely. <laughs> And so, yeah, and so it is an open, inclusive event for anyone to come along to perform or just listen to music and spoken word. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I actually don't do anything myself. It's just a platform for other people to do it. A lot of yeah. people that run spoken word and music, they're musicians or they're p people that write poetry. I've got none of those amazing abilities. I just offer a platform for people to showcase mm. because there are so many talented people in Birmingham it could blow your mind the yeah. amount of talent that I see and so that's one of the things my name you wanted to talk about oh yes 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 please yeah because we only know you as Autumn on this podcast <laughs> yeah okay Autumn Aldous so Aldous is A-L-D-O-U-S so it's Autumn Aldous quite a few years about three years ago so not that long ago my daughter said to me Debbie that I've been christened Debbie. Debbie, you don't sound like a Debbie. And I said, don't I? I said, what do I sound like? I said, what am I? And she said, you sound like Autumn. And I put the two names together, Autumn Aldous. Nice ring to suddenly, it, yeah. And I thought, do you know who that goes? And I did a bit of a Google search, and I realised I am the only Autumn Aldous. 
<laughs> and so I thought, yeah. And so I run a lot of meetup groups. And so they all know me as Autumn Aldous. Yeah. I've got quite a few Facebook pages as Autumn Aldous. Right. My apps and my sleep cushions will be Autumn Aldous as well. And my book, Autumn Aldous. But I don't mind what people call me. Some people call me Debbie. Some people call me Deborah. That's what my childhood name was, Deborah. But I don't mind. No. But I, I do quite like for business the name Autumn Aldous because it goes together quite well. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, that's a lovely story. And well done to your daughter for <laughs> coming up with that. That's brilliant. <laughs> How clever is she? <laughs> She takes after her mum, I'm sure. <laughs> she actually is a poet. She writes amazing poetry, totally unlike me. Oh, my God. <laughs> and she sings. She's got an amazing voice as well. Again, totally unlike me. That's obviously why you're doing the music and spoken word for her. You know, she doesn't come along hardly. <laughs> She's oh. too shy. <laughs> oh, God. That's Hopefully when she gets a little bit older, she will. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm... Well, I hope I've got everything out of you that I needed to. There are so many amazing things that you're doing. So please tell us, please tell the listeners, where can they find all of these amazing workshops that you're delivering? Where's the best place for them to find you? If you put into Google Autumn Aldous and Meetup, it should bring you up to all of my public workshops because I run quite a few Meetup sites called Mindful Midlanders. Right. And the Midlands Happiness Social, and I do a Staffordshire one as well. But they're all linked to the Autumn Aldous name. Right. You can also find, I've got a lot of Facebook pages as well. So if you put Autumn Aldous into Facebook, I think it will come back to my self-development groups. So I try to list them on there as well. Right. And that's how you can contact me directly on Facebook as well. So I've got three Facebook pages under the name of Autumn Aldous. Okay. And I've got the general things as well. My name, Debbie Aldous, is in Facebook. And my email address is just DebraJaneAldous at gmail.com. That's D-E-B-R-A-J-A-N-E-A-L-D-O-U-S at gmail.com. It isn't difficult to find me. I do a lot in the community. And I advertise my email and telephone number, I think, everywhere. And so it's, I think, I say famous last words, I think to find me should be quite easy. OK. And I mean, these events on Meetup, they're not fr all free, are they? No. No. OK. Um, they charge. I try to keep it down as little as I can. So they start from £5. Right. For mindfulness. Most of them are £7. And if it's a two hour session, it's £10. Right. But if people can't afford it, I will never, ever turn people away. Because my point is I want to help as many people as they can. Yeah. And so if people can only afford to give a donation, and I do have people come along and just put in even a few pennies, if that's all they can afford, I would never, ever stop anyone coming. Okay. It's more about being out there and being able to help and support people. Got you. You're amazing. And and so on the meetup, the way it works, people register there to that they're coming and they kind of pay on the door. Is that how yes. it works? They do pay on the door, but all of my meetups are open, so you don't even need to register. Right, right. And I advertise on Live Brum as well. But if you go on to Meetup and you just have a look, you I mean, it's its best if you register because then you'll get notifications of my up and coming ones. That's right. But, but sometimes if you just look and you see what's coming up, what's on in Birmingham, I've had people just put what's on and some of the events I have had come up on there. Okay, well, I'll share your, I found your, your, your specific page. Yeah. Um, so I'll share the link to that and then they can see all of the workshops that are coming up. Yeah. I list uh, them about six weeks in advance. I put them on Live Brum, Eventbrite and a few other places as well on my Facebook pages. And so I do widely, I could do better, but I do try to spread the word, mostly online though. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Okay, Autumn, that's just been really, really useful to know. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your story on the Share Your Story podcast with me today. Uh, it sounds absolutely fascinating and hugely inspirational for, for people who are in business, people who are starting out. So really, really do appreciate it. And I'm sure we'll see each other at a future 
networking event. If not one of your events, I probably would <laughs> love to come to one of them, except the dating one. I'm already sorted there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'll be coming to that. Uh, but it sounds like you're definitely catering for what's current. So well done to you. Big round of applause. And uh, I'll speak to you soon. Thank you, Michael. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 